Welcome, friends, to Voice of Assurance, the MP3 edition. I'm Dr. Tom Kakuza, pastor of Northland Bible Baptist Church in St. Cloud, Minnesota. The purpose of Voice of Assurance is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to equip believers through verse-by-verse -verse preaching and topical message. Now, while there is no substitute for individual participation in a sound local church, I trust these messages will augment your spiritual growth and be a blessing to you. Let's go ahead now to the message. If you have a Bible, turn with me over to John chapter 16. John 16. Are you being guided by the Holy Spirit? You know, there is an awful lot today that's being attributed to the Holy Spirit. Some of it is good, and some of it is very bizarre, very strange stuff. Uh, you've got a lot of strange movements today that have absolutely no scriptural basis whatsoever. Things such as the holy laughter movement, the holy howling movement where people are actually howling like wolves in church, barking. You've got barking going on in churches today. People trying to attribute all these things, bizarre things and in, 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 uh, acting, uh, not acting, but um, uh, manifestations that they say have to do with, with the Lord. I heard a new one just recently, and they were not being sarcastic. This is, this is legitimate. They were talking about, and this one just, it's, it's almost unbelievable, holy vomiting. This is something going on now where people supposedly under the control of the Holy Spirit are actually throwing up in church. I don't know about you, but if that's what the Holy Spirit's offering, folks, I just don't want to have a part of that. Now, that, I don't mean to sound sacrilegious, but that is just so contrary. How far are we going to go with this stuff? Then you had this weird stuff going down in Lakeland, Florida, to where this, this pastor is actually hitting people and kicking people, supposedly, that God is telling them to do that, to get them to do spiritual things, and basically assaulting people in the church in the name of Christ. All right? Is that the work of the Holy Spirit? Well, no. Is it real? Yes, it's real. Listen, don't say that what a person's experiencing is not real. It's real. They're experiencing. But we, we are asking, what is the source of that? And how does the Holy Spirit guide us? Well, what is, what is real? Specifically, what Jesus told his disciples is what's real. And he told them what he was going to do through them. The ministry he had for several of them was a very unique ministry and became a treasure for the body of Christ. And that's what we're looking at today. I think it's talked about here, particularly in one verse, and we are going to look at that. But not only are we going to look at that this morning, we're going to branch out to that and bring this down to the days in which we live. You know, we are living in, from the world's perspective, in very uncertain times, aren't we? The economy is in the tank. Where are we going? In these uncertain days in which we live, and, and has God spoken about these things? Well, let's look at the Bible. Let's look at a couple things first. In John chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. He's talking to his disciples. It is expedient for you that I go, that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And that's the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit was first going to be dealing with, in the context here, we talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the world in which we live. We covered that in detail last week. When he has come, he'll reprove or convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And the Holy Spirit is convicting the world. And how is he really convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment? He's doing it through the church, through the body of Christ, and he's doing it through the ministry of the Word of God. The ministry of the word of God. Verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. We see the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the disciples from this point on. They could not fully understand all that the Lord had taught them up to this point. That's why some of the questions they asked him, we see their question, we say, didn't they get it? The answer to that is no, they didn't get it. All right? Understand, they were the first ones to go through and experience and see firsthand the things that had been promised for thousands of years. They could not fully understand all that the Lord had taught them. But our Lord tells them of what is coming and one of the major ways the Holy Spirit would work in their lives. 
one of the major ways the Holy Spirit will work in their lives, and it would be through the Word of God, through the Word of God. You see in verse 13, look at verse 13, which is full of truth. It says this in verse 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you. Who's he talking to? His disciples. Okay. Now, yeah, there's a secondary application to us, but particularly first and foremost, he's talking to them. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He will show you things to come. The Bible Knowledge Commentary is a very good small paragraph on this. It says this, and I quote, the spirit, Jesus said, would not teach the disciples on his own or on his own initiative, but would teach only what he hears from the father. This points up the interdependence of the persons in the Trinity. The father would tell the spirit what to teach the apostles about the son, all right, and about things to come as as we would speak would see. But you notice in verse 13, a very interesting phrase, the spirit would guide them into all truth. Do you see that at the first part of verse 13? He would guide them into all truth. The reason is a simple one. He is the spirit of truth. This phrase, this phrase, the spirit of truth is used three times here in John referring to the Holy Spirit. John 14, 15, 16, we see the spirit of truth mentioned. Now, how would he guide them into all truth? Now, while he would guide them into all truth in general, I believe both of the truths found in verse 13 have to do with something the disciples would do in the future. You notice Jesus said, show you things to come. Two aspects of this. The first is this. He would guide them into all truth by giving them the New Testament scriptures. What we have in scripture is all truth. Folks, this is the word of God. This is the word of God. All right. You might say, well, it's been copied, copied, copied. Yes. And I understand in the original manuscripts that were given, we don't have the absolute actual originals in our hands. But the process of copying the scriptures down through the millennium has been so meticulous, so careful, that what we have today is we we know it is accurate because of all that's taken place down through the ages and the meticulous copying of scripture through these guys, they call them the scribes, all right, the scribes. And people question, question, question a lot of these things. Then in the 1940s, something was discovered called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And what they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they took the Dead Sea Scrolls, which went back to the the early times, I believe was the days of Christ, maybe before. I don't remember the detail on that. But they went back and they took it and they compared it with what we have today. They're virtually identical. Okay, God has preserved his word. And so you can pick your Bible up with confidence and say, you know what? This is the word of God. What we have in scripture is all truth. Isn't it interesting? He said he would guide us. The spirit, when the spirit would come, he would guide them into all truth. Okay. In other words, they would record the inspired word of God himself. A couple references you can write down, and we'll shoot them up here on the, on the screen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it tells us this, all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration, the word means God breathed it out, okay? This is not man's opinion. This is not men dreaming stuff up. It is literally breathe out the word of God. I like what the new Schofield says. If God himself had done the writing, it would be no more accurate nor authoritative than what it is. You understand? If God sent from heaven, literally documents that floated down from heaven and landed here and he said, this is the word of God. If he did that, it would be no more authoritative or accurate than what we were given through the writers of scripture. This through the writers of scripture, this is how God gave us his inspired word. And so it is God breathed. Now listen, 
We look at it and we say, the Bible is the word of God. But understand, there's an attack today. And a lot of your new translations, quote unquote translations coming out, they'll say, well, this is the word of God. But what they're doing is they're using a technique called dynamic equivalency. In other words, what they do is they take the words of God because every word is inspired. Do we understand that? And they'll say, well, let's just translate the general sense of it. No, my friend, you're playing fast and loose with the Word of God. It isn't the general idea. It's each word as much as possible. Each word as much as possible. That's the idea of translation. And that is based on a proper respect for the doctrine of inspiration. Inspiration, God breathed out not only the concepts, he breathed out the very words. They wrote down the very words God wanted. Now, why is that important? Because who are we to play around with what God has to say? It's arrogance in the highest degree. Now, I'll tell you what, I would not like to be a translator of the scriptures. I don't know about enough about things like that to fool around with that. We trust what we have. We know it. It's been tried and proven. No Bible has stood the test of time longer than the KJV. There's none. It's an amazing, amazing book that we have here. But he would give it, and he said he would lead them into all truth, and all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, which is teaching, for reproof, which is conviction, for correction, which is a restoration, for instruction in righteousness. You notice the Bible will do for us what we need done to us. That's why sometimes you'll come to church and you'll go out and you'll say, man alive, well, I feel under conviction. I feel under conviction, okay? Don't attribute it to the preacher. Now, I'm not saying a preacher can't do that, but it's the preacher's job to simply preach the word. And the word of God will bring conviction at time. It will also bring uh, encouragement. It'll bring correction. It'll bring instruction in righteousness. It'll sometimes just, uh, it'll just bring us doctrine, which is teaching. The word doctrine means teaching. Okay. See, the Holy Spirit, even today as I am preaching the Word of God, the Holy Spirit is dealing with each and every one of us in this room, and some of us in a different way than the person sitting next to us. Okay. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, talks about the process. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved, moved by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit. Okay. They spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This is very important. Jesus said in John 17, 17, and we'll be getting to that in in weeks to come, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word, here it is, thy word is truth. People, they say, what is truth? Here it is. I don't believe that. Why not? See, you ask what it is, we tell you what it is, and you say you don't believe it. Where do you go from there? It is the truth, and it proves itself as we're going to see in just a moment, okay? Let me give you an application here at this point. Always remember that the Holy Spirit, okay, is not going to lead you to do something that is contrary to the Word of God, right? This is a constant problem among Christians today, and it's, folks, it's only going to get worse as we deny the sufficiency of Scripture, The Holy Spirit is not going to lead you contrary to the Bible. Why? Because understand, the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. He has spoken, and he is not going to say, well, I know what I've given you, and I've preserved it all these years. As a matter of fact, folks, it's going to be preserved forever. It's the eternal Word of God. It says the Word of God abides forever. But he has given us this book, and then somebody comes along and says, well, the Holy Spirit's leading me to do this. And it's like, wait a minute, he can't lead you to do that, because he's already spoken in the Scripture, and the Scripture says, this is what you're supposed to do. Well, yeah, but I prayed about it. I prayed about it. I heard a pastor say this once, why pray about something where God's already given you the answer in the Bible? Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that just practical? You don't have to pray about it. If God's already given us the answer in Scripture, why pray about it? Oh, I'm looking for an answer. He's already given the answer. Uh, Forget that. I'm looking for an answer. What they're saying is, I'm looking for a way to do what my flesh wants to do. Now, that's a spiritual problem right there. He'll never lead contrary to Scripture. 
People wonder why we emphasize the Bible so much and hold it in such high esteem in our church. It's because it has come from God himself. It is the truth written in a book. It's objective. It's objective. And it gives us clear principles to live by, okay? The folks, the Bible declares there is a right and there is a wrong. In issues of morality, in issues of living and so forth, there is a right, there is a wrong. God has spoken on these things. And this is the danger of what's called the emerging or the emergent church today is because they say it's not an issue of right and wrong anymore. We are dealing with a dialogue. Everything is on the table. This is what they're teaching in these churches. Everything is on the table. What everybody used to believe, how do we know that's even right anymore? Let's get together and discuss it and determine. Now, some of them won't go this far, but this is what they're saying. Let's get together and discuss it, in parentheses, and determine what we believe is right and wrong. Now, what's the problem with that? You know what the problem with that is? If this paper was human opinion, and this is the word of God, here's what's happened in modern times, folks. When somebody says that, what they've done is they've put the Bible down and they've put their opinion up. Chaos is the result. Chaos is the result. We always must go back to scriptures. Not only that, but can I tell you that this is indicative of the days in which we live, the last days? Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this is where we're going. And this is why you need to be careful in what you believe about Scripture. You can never give Scripture too high of a place in your life because God is the one who gave us the Bible. The Lord said he honors his word above his own name. Imagine that. We don't worship the Bible, but we do worship the God of the Bible. But we hold the Bible in such reverence and high esteem because this came from him. 2 Timothy 3.1 It says this, this know that in the last days, perilous times, okay, hard times, difficult times, treacherous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Can I say their own opinions? For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Boy, don't we live in unthankful times? It is amazing how unthankful people are. Unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. That's an interesting word. It means without self-control. A society and a world out of control. Fierce, despisers of those that are good. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded. Look at this. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Is that not America? That's where we're at, folks. You know, over the years, I don't, I hopefully none of you are this way. Over the years, we've had people who just, you know, oh man, I hope, you know, watch the time here in church. And they just say, I'm going to miss them. I'm going to miss a kickoff or this or that. Well, now listen, I'm not here to make enemies today, but it's if, especially if you're rooting for the The state team here, if you miss the kickoff of a Viking game, it's not the end of the world, okay? Folks, how can we fool around when you're comparing a game with God? But look at this. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You know, we're becoming more like the Romans every day. Having, look at verse 5. Here's where it gets, here's where it touches churches. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Folks, we are living in treacherous days. Don't let it discourage you, though. If you've trusted Christ as Savior, these are the most exciting days, some of the most exciting days of human history. And we get the opportunity to live for Christ in these days and to share Christ with the lost world in which we live. See, this is where we are today. This is where we are today. And this is the direction it's going. Now, I've mentioned he would guide them into all truth by giving them New Testament scriptures. But you notice back in in verse 13, John 16, 13, it said, and he will show you things to come. He will show you things to come. All right. What is that referring to? I personally believe it's referring to the prophetic scriptures that were yet to come, that the disciples were going to, through inspiration, be writing down. 
The Bible is the only book in the world that can do this. Can I say that again? The Bible is the only book in the world that can do this and do it with accuracy. This is very unique. The Bible has true prophecy in it. As a matter of fact, at least one third of the Bible is prophetic. That's why I have a hard time with these, and I'll use the term loosely, evangelical, they're hardly even evangelical anymore, preachers, very popular ones, some of them huge name people, many of them out of California, who will say this, I refuse to teach, I will not teach on prophecy because I don't think that's relevant to reaching people today. I don't think it's something that we need to be concerned with about prophecy. Well, friend, God did. He thought it was so important. He made a third of the Bible, one third. That's a big piece of the pie, isn't it? A third of the Bible is prophetic. Should we not be talking about it? The truth of it is at least a third of the time if we're going to be people of the book. Look with me to Isaiah 48. This is a major issue And I want to challenge your thinking today because you could possibly be here and think, you know, I'm not interested in prophecy. I don't see why that's relevant to me. Well, it is relevant because if you know what's coming in the future, you can be properly prepared for that and you can help others be properly prepared for that. Isaiah 48, and what does it prove? It proves that the God of the Bible is the one true God, that the God of the Bible has given us a book. It is a miracle book. Listen, when when history is written in advance and nations are given by name that will rule and reign in this world, and it comes to pass exactly as God said, what should that do for the Christian? That should build our confidence in Christ. That should make us stronger believers. Isaiah 48, verse 3, the Lord says this, I have declared the former things from the beginning, And they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them. I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. He said, I I said I would do it, and I did it. They came to pass, and look what he says. Because I knew that thou art obstinate, he's talking to Israel here, You're, you're stubborn, and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow brass. I have even from the beginning declared it to thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it thee, lest thou should say, Mine idol hath done them, and my graven image and my molten image hath commanded them. He says, listen, I gave you the prophetic word, and I fulfilled it so that you would see I am the one true God. I am the one true God, and really all the others are false. Isaiah chapter, we won't go there, Isaiah 43, 11, he says this, he says, I, even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. How's that for a clear scripture? Jesus himself could not have said it any clearer, could he? See, when you think of Peter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James, Paul, they all gave us prophecy. They all gave us prophecy. I cannot help but think especially of the book of Revelation written by the Apostle John in, in, the, in the 90s, the AD 90s, folks. This huge, grand central station book of the prophetic word of God. All right? Where even in chapter 1, and we won't go there, but in chapter 1, it gives us the, the clear outline of history. He says, write the things that have been, the things that are, and the things that will yet be. And what do we see in Revelation 1? We see the things that, that have been. Okay, he talks about it. The things that are, chapters 2 and 3, has to do with the church age in which we live. And then the things that will be, chapter 4 through chapter 22 of Revelation, has to do with the future. Right there, clearly given to us. See, time is flying by. Time is flying by. Do we realize it? Folks, do we realize things are flying at such an incredible pace that society and the world in which we live right now is so fragile. The economy is fragile. Food supply is fragile. Nations, as far as going to war with one another, it's, it's fragile. It's touchy. It's, it's like we live on top of a powder keg continually. What's going to happen? Time is flying by. The weeks go by like days, don't they? Months like weeks, years like months. Before you know it, life is over. Or even better yet, for the believer, Jesus is taking us out of here. Wouldn't that be great? That would be great. There are many believers today, though, who are forsaking the doctrine of the imminent return of Christ. 
Can I tell you even that is a fulfillment of Scripture? Let me show that to you. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. We'll have it up here. But 2 Peter chapter 3, very interesting. Primarily, this is not talking about believers, but things have gotten so out of whack that it even applies to Christians today. There are many Christians who used to believe in a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial rapture. In other words, that the rapture could take place at any moment, at any moment. They believe Jesus could come back at any moment. And, and something that helped popularize this, okay, was, was back in the 60s when Hal Lindsey wrote the book, The Late Great Planet Earth, got people thinking about it. He came out with several more books. And then there were great scholars of scripture, uh, such as John Wolverd and some others who have written fantastic things, J. Dwight Pentecost, the late Dr. M. R. D. Hahn, the list goes on and on, who've written great books on prophecy, having to do with the end times. And then, of course, now just a survey here this morning. How many of you have read at least one of the Left Behind books? Okay, most of you have. Uh, very interesting reading. Uh, don't look at those books as scripture. Okay, don't look at them as scripture. Don't base your theology on the books. But they did have a, overall, they had a pretty good skeleton there as far as an outline of what things will be. I disagree with when they believe Russia's invasion will take place. But, uh, uh, but anyways, that's, a, that's another issue. But the point is here. A lot of people who used to believe Jesus could come back at any moment, they don't believe it anymore. They don't believe it. They've forsaken dispensational teaching. Isn't it interesting? 2 Peter 3, verse 3, it says this, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Where is he? I don't see it. You Christians have been talking about Jesus coming back for thousands of years. You keep saying it. You're saying it all the time. And we don't believe you. We don't believe it anymore. Things just continue on as they have been for all this time. Now, you know, it's one thing for a lost person to say it. But folks, it's another thing for believers to say it. But we are living in the days of apostasy. Most people are concerned about the future, but yet a lot of people will reject what the Bible says. And yet the Bible is very clear, very clear. What I'd like to do in the remaining time this morning, I'd like to give you eight truths having to do with the last days. I'm just going to give you references with most of this because we're, we're, we're not going to have enough time to go into detail Eight issues. Why do we believe we are in the last days? Why do we believe Jesus is coming back soon? Okay, I'm not trying to be sensational with this today. I believe this in my heart. I believe this like I believe John 3.16, okay? I'm telling you that I actually believe each and every day I'm going to see Jesus. I believe that. That's become a growing, motivating factor in my life as a Christian, as I live every day. And that is in line with the teaching of the church the way it's supposed to be. And I'm not talking about just this church. I'm talking about the biblical body of Christ. This is the way it was in the days of the apostles. They believed in eminency. People say, well, the brethren came up with that in the late 1800s with John Darby. No, he didn't. He didn't come up with it. John believed it. Paul believed it. Peter believed it. James believed it. It's all in their writings. It's clear. Folks, this goes right back to the New Testament when it was given. We are close to the rapture. Why do I say it? It is because we are beginning to see the fulfillment of prophecy that will be fulfilled close to or within the tribulation period, a seven-year period of time that is yet to come upon the earth. Or what's called the 70th week of Daniel is another way of calling it that. As believers, we ought to be excited and encouraged by that. Jesus is coming soon. As one of my... Uh, professors in Bible college who has gone on to be with the Lord quite a while ago now. He used to say in class, he says, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker, right? That's how we ought to be looking. I'm not looking to die physically. I'm looking to be raptured. Let me give you eight signs of the last days. Now, remember, none of these have to take place before the rapture takes place. The rapture could have taken place in the days of the apostles, if God wanted to pull it off, he could have done it then. God is the one who orchestrates the way things go. First is this, Israel, for the tribulation period to take place. Now remember, the rapture takes place 
before the tribulation period. There are no signs for the rapture, but there are signs for the tribulation period. And the first is this, Israel has to be back in the land as a nation. And of course, Israel has been back in the land as a nation since 1948, since 1948. Because the tribulation period has to do with the nation of Israel first and foremost, then the rest of the world. So they had to be back in the land and they came back in 1948. Ezekiel chapters 36 and 37. Okay, you have there the resurrection of a nation. You have the prophecy concerning the bones, you know, the dry bones. You remember the song? You remember the, some of you remember the song, hip bone connected to the thigh bone. Na, na. Remember that? What was, the, what was the last part of that? Hear the word of the Lord. Interesting, huh? Secular, quote unquote, song based on scripture. That used to be a part of the American fiber. Israel has to be back in the land as a nation. They've been there since 1948. Secondly, the ongoing push for a Middle East peace plan. They're talking about it continually. Every American president pushes this, wants it to take place under their administration. I don't know if they want the bragging rights or what for this. They push, they push, they push. It is a constant thing. It's a constant talk. Condoleezza Rice going over there for this or that as the Secretary of State. All these things going on. Where do we see that? Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 talks about there would be a covenant that the Antichrist would make a covenant there or establish or strengthen a covenant already in existence in the Middle East to bring peace between the Jews and the, and the uh, uh, Arab nations. And it's always going on. And it's coming, by the way, it's coming. Third, the ongoing plans to rebuild the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Folks, this is not hearsay. These people are ready. All the, the tools, the implementations, the instruments, even musical instruments for temple worship. These things are not being talked about. These things are made. They are ready. They are waiting in the wings to be used in a rebuilt temple. Now, why is the rebuilt temple such an important part? Because the temple is going to stand in Jerusalem during the tribulation period. And they have been talking for years about rebuilding the temple. They've got plans for it. They've got people in place for it. Daniel 9, 27, Matthew 24, 15, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, etc. This has to be there for what's called the abomination of desolation to take place, according to these scriptures. And the abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist, who will be revealed after the rapture, when he halfway through the seven-year period of tribulation, where there is supposedly going to be peace for seven years, he is going to go into the temple rebuilt in Jerusalem, claim himself to be God and to be worshipped as God. That's halfway through the tribulation. That's what's called the abomination of desolation or the abomination that makes desolate. These are signs. Number four, the European Union is becoming more and more a picture of the revived Roman Empire prophesied in the book of Daniel. The European Union is becoming more and more a picture of the revived Roman Empire prophesied in the book of Daniel. I personally believe it is the fulfillment. I can't prove that, but I believe it is the fulfillment. This will be the last government before Jesus rules and reigns on the earth. Think of that. Think of that. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7 talk about this revived Roman Empire. What do we mean by Roman, okay? It will cover the area that the old Roman Empire at the time of Jesus covered. See, everything is going back to that. We've been on hold for some 2,000 years, and everything is lining up again, just like it did in the days of Jesus. The world is going to that direction. Number five, Europe today has a unified currency in the euro. Now, I believe we are moving in the direction of a global economy along with a cashless society in preparing this week. And by the way, Revelation 13, 17, bear this out. In preparing this week, wouldn't it be interesting? I, this I never occurred to me until this week. The instability of the financial markets at this time, could that not be used easily to move us into the direction of a one world currency? Just say, you know what, let's forget about the dollar is this and this and that and this country's up and that one's down. Let's just everybody get together and have a one world currency, a one world currency. And that way it's the currency is the currency is the currency. 
all over the world. It's going to go in that direction. Cashless society, it's going to go in that direction. So we've been talking for years about the different ways uh, that this could be accomplished, and a lot of you know about the, the little... Uh, identification thing that can be inserted on a lot. Some of you probably have pets that have that between their shoulder blades. They go and it's a way to identify them if they run away and they just they know everything about them. They just run the scanner over the little chip and tells them all this information about them. Some people have those implanted even now. I'm not saying that's the mark of the beast. I'm just saying these are things that, that could be used to bring about a cashless Society, a cashless society. Okay, let me ask you this one. How many of you have a debit card? All right, that's not the mark of the beast, but I'm just saying, isn't it amazing how easy these things can take place? Number six, Russia will be a major world power. Russia will be a major world power. You will see more and more alliances and cooperation between Russia and the Islamic enemies of Israel. This is a fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 and 39. This is coming, and you're going to see it more and more. I can remember when the Soviet Union imploded, and everybody got all over those of us who believe that Russia would be a big player in the last days. Yeah, what are you going to do with it now? They'll be back. Guess what? They're back and getting stronger by the day. This is headed towards the fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 and 39. By the way, if any of you have a Schofield reference Bible, a Schofield reference Bible, read the note on Ezekiel 39 sometime, not now, but sometime. The notes of the Schofield reference Bible were written in 1909. This is before the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. When the notes in the Schofield Bible were written in 1909, Russia was nothing at that point. Number seven. Political, moral, and natural turmoil. Political, moral, and natural turmoil. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Romans 1, 21 through 32. Boy, I tell you, we're running, we've run out of time, literally. Write down Matthew 24, 3 through 8. Listen, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Don't be troubled, for all these things must come to pass. Jesus said, the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. And he's talking about the tribulation period. And what are we seeing? We're seeing all these things happening in the days in which we live. Number eight, the last one, and we'll close on this one, a slide into theological apostasy. This is a falling away from the truth. Second Peter, or Second Timothy 4, 2 through 4. Folks, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Let me close with just a few scriptures with you. Look over in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Because you may be here today and you may say, you know what? I'm kind of scared now with all these things you're telling me. I'm scared of what you're talking about. Well, you don't have to be scared. Look with me to John chapter 3. Because the Lord tells you how you can not only escape the tragedies that are coming on the world, the Lord tells you how you can escape hell itself, which is the ultimate tragedy, isn't it? In John 3, 16, it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What is he talking about there? Well, he's talking about what we call the gospel. Look up here, would you? If this represents you and me, my hand, left hand, my wallet represents our sin. Here we have sin on us. My wallet's on my left hand here. We're sin on us. God loves us, though. He hates our sin. See, sin separates us from the Lord. But you know, here we are. God loves us. He hates our sin. We cannot get to heaven, not even with one sin. We have to be sinless in the eyes of God. None of us are. How are we going to get to heaven? Well, we've all sinned. God says our sin must be paid for, and if we do it, the wages of sin is death. We'll be separated from God in hell for all eternity if we do it ourselves. It's the only payment God will accept. People say, well, I, I'll, I'll do good works. No, friend, good works will not take away your sin. Good works will not save you. It says, uh, let's look at this, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says this, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Good works cannot take away our sin. Well, what can take away our sin? 
The only thing that can take away our sin is if somebody does something for us. Now watch this, watch this. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid our sin debt. He paid for all of our sins, not only what we've done. He's paid for every sin, even in the future. Because when he died, all of our sins were in the future. He paid for all of our sins, came back from the dead. And he says, if you will put your faith in him, if you will trust in him, he will give you as a gift everlasting life. Romans 5, 8 puts it this way. It says, but God commended or displayed his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, see here we are sinners. God doesn't say to you, get rid of your sin, forsake, do all these things. You got to be sorry. You got to turn. No, no, no. While we were yet sinners, but God commended his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If Christ died for us and he's paid our sin debt, what does that leave us to do? Nothing but simply believe, trust in him that he did that for us. And when you believe, when you trust him as your savior, when you put your faith in him, you are saved by grace. You're saved by grace. Friend, if you've never trusted Christ as your savior, would you trust him today? Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening, and would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.